Elites. Mitchell, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. How are you? Doing great. We're, we're excited to, to hear uh, your story and just even what you have to say about, about leadership. Um, I know you recently told me that you just finished uh, like a 10 day motorcycling trip. Yeah, I did. So <laughs> yeah. <what>? So, <laughs> so how often do you do you do those type of 10 day trips? Well, not often enough, that's for sure. But this just seemed like the year to do it again. So I, I learned to ride a motorcycle about 10 years ago, and it just changed my life in a lot of ways. And this trip we just took is because everything else this year has been canceled. And my husband and I decided sort of last minute to, we actually flew, we flew from Nashville, where we lived to San Francisco, we rented a Harley. And we rode for 10 days through six states. We went 3,000 miles through wow. California, Oregon, Montana, Wyoming, Utah. What did I forget? Oh, Idaho. Of course, Idaho. Wow, oh my gosh, wow. Idaho was amazing. It was beautiful. We were all back roads. So more to come on that. But yeah, we just got back. It was very mind clearing and very enlightening about life and leadership. 3,000 miles, like even driving 3,000 miles is something that <laughs> I think I have a hard time doing. So kudos to you. It Kudos was to you. So, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, let's say, so around that, you know, being able to, to motorcycle, um, I mean, just when I hear someone that's a, you know, drives motorcycles, um, I, I think of them as a very free spirit. Um, I mean, daring, I guess, in a way, but just someone that likes to just do, right? Um, is that how you always been? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, I've always loved to travel. So that might be a little bit of an insight. When I was a little girl, I grew up in a small town in Illinois and my parents, my father was California. And so every, I think it was about every other summer, we would get in this big green station wagon <laughs> and we would ride across the country to go to California to see my, my father's parents and spend some time with those grandparents. And I remember those trips so well, you know, the license plate game that you would play with yeah. your, your, your brothers or sisters and, and um, like watching for the state line sign, you know, to cross and know you, you were in another state. It's the same thrill. I think everybody enjoys travel in, in different ways, but it's so much to me about, um, realizing the world is a very big place and you're I'm not the center of it <laughs> which we often forget in leadership we forget about we think only about our troubles our challenges our opportunities and we forget about everybody else way too much and so I think travel has a way of really making you be humble and to think about how rich and interesting other people are and, and different ways of doing things it really broadens your broadens your thinking yeah, I mean the right. The world is our oyster, and there's there's so much there's so much to see, so much to do, um, and I think from you know your past experience, right? Because you've done a lot around PR, public relations, um, and I think I remember reading a story about how you you asked your mom like, or you know, what what would you want to be when you grow up, or something like in that essence, and she said, I just want you to be happy, mm -hmm. um, and then from that point, that's when you decided, hey, happy means PR. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? So I know my parents were both scientists. My father was an organic chemist and my mother was a microbiologist. And I just had this idea about when I learned about public relations, um, I thought, I think I want to do that as a career. But I thought, oh, I think they might be disappointed because it like wasn't a lawyer or a doctor or whatever you were supposed to be. Um, and I explained it to my mom, you know, when, and because I asked her, what do you want me to be? She said, I want you to be happy. I said, well, good, then this is what I want to do. <laughs> And, you know, it's sort of funny because you, and now that I'm a parent, when my children have come to me to say the things that they wanted to do or the places they wanted to go, you have to be willing to let them spread their wings and try, you know, and that's really one of the best things you can do as a parent is for your child to believe that they can try and do different things. And I didn't have any idea that my life would end up being all about entrepreneurship, which of course is a whole nother adventure to life, not just picking a career, but thinking you could actually start in a business um, in that space is really um, an interesting challenge in life. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good concept that you've mentioned, right? Spread your wings and and learn new things and and try, because you know even that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? As as you've done and as I've done, like you're you're constantly evolving, right? It's mm -hmm. not just a one size fit all, and that's what I do for the rest of my life. And I think it's it's very fitting because right now you're doing a lot around leadership and just in general, and I think around being able to spread your wings and fly and to think in different, different ways. Um, so your, your PR experience, right. Um, that it evolved around some entrepreneurship as well. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah. then you, you led into leadership. But let's start with the entrepreneurship experience. Is that okay. something that you just, I mean, you knew you were interested in PR, but like, as you, you mentioned, entrepreneurship is a journey. It's challenging, right? Why entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I guess I always thought I would start a business. And it's, it's interesting, I, when I speak and talk to, to people these days, a lot of times, especially with younger leaders or young professionals, I'll say, how many of you think you might want to start a business someday? And a lot of hands go up because I think it's a lot more common or more popular these days to think about, hey, I want to be able to run my own show. Right. You know, I have ideas and I want to make them come true. There's a lot of appeal to that. And I would say that these days, especially with technology, you can do that more. But I tell them, don't do it right away because there's still so much you want to learn about yourself and your craft, you know, whatever industry you're in, but also about business and how to run a successful business. That's a whole other ball game. So you might be a master craftsman, you know, really good at what you do in PR or whatever your industry is. But to know how to run a business is an entirely different skill set. And I was I was 13 years into my career before I started an agency of my own. So I worked in two advertising agencies and a public relations agency. And then I was in corporate life for a number of years. I was the director of corporate communications for Embassy Suites, Hampton Inn and Homewood Suites Hotel chains, the national chains. Love that experience in corporate life. And then my husband was finishing his education. We were in Memphis at the time. And he, as I often laugh and say, and write in my book, I say, he drugged me kicking and screaming all the way to Arkansas. <laughs> Cause I was thinking, I don't want to go live in Arkansas. I want to live, you know, in some great American city where I can, you know, basically have global domination in my industry. That was my very small and simple dream <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was yeah. to run, rule the world in my industry. And I didn't think I was going to be able to do it from a small community, but funny story when I got there, I realized there wasn't a public relations agency of any kind in wow. Northwest Arkansas back then. And I saw an opportunity to start my own business and I did. And right there in our backyard were three corporate offices of companies that people might have heard of. So Walmart, Tyson Foods, and J.B. Hunt were all headquartered right there in wow. my own backyard. And I thought, my gosh, this is a great opportunity to start a public relations agency of my own I'd worked for several and that was when I started and that was about 20 years ago when I first did that. Yeah and then I think from from there you were able to like your first customer or, or client was was um, your previous employer right? Mm-hmm. That's right so when I tell people I cheated just a little bit so when I <laughs> when I told my employer that I was leaving to move for my husband's um, career opportunities um, I, I said but that's the bad news I didn't want to leave But I said, the good news is I'm going to start my own agency and I want to take you with me as my first client. So I slid a proposal across the table to him. And of course, he was kind of sitting there. I was like, what? You're moving? Like, where are you going and why? And oh, here's this piece of paper in front of me. And he said, well, let me get back to you. He came back the very next day and said yes. And then I remember thinking, oh, my word, I have no idea how to start a company. (laughs) And all of a sudden it kind of set in is I have a client I better create some sort of a, you know, going concern here to really be able to service them. And that's how I started and kept them for a number of years, but had to, of course, at that point, begin to think about how do you build a client portfolio and how do you, how do you win clients? How do you, how do you price yourself? How do you market yourself? How do you even have a business card? I mean, you know, it was all the basics, just trying to get out of the gate and figure it out. And that took a number of years to really sort of nail down and understand what I thought I had to offer that somebody might actually be willing to pay me money for. And that's, that's a big part of entrepreneurship too, which is what's your value proposition to the world? Who will pay for what you have to offer and why would they hire you over somebody else? Yeah. Something that you said, I mean, you, you use the word cheating, but um, Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's brilliant actually. um, And very uh, courageous. I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, we are, for whatever reason, there's this hesitation to, to really get out there and show people our craft, show people what we're able to do. And which, what you're able to do is like from day one, position yourself for success. Because one thing that we always talk about around My Dream Big Club is the, just getting to that first sale, right? Because then there's so much confidence that comes with it, right? And knowing that your previous employer w- was willing and able to pay you, um, it just validates what you have to do. So I, I mean, speak to entrepreneurs because that that takes a certain you know level of thinking, right? Around you know 
your idea of let me just throw this proposal. I have no idea how I'm going to get this done, but I, I feel like I have something to, to add, right? Because I think a lot of people are in that, in that position. They have a lot to add, but they don't know how to get that first customer or they, they're not courageous enough to kind of pull what you just pulled. Yeah, I agree. I think that's really, really difficult. In fact, I think it's scary in two different ways. One is I'm scared if I can't sell myself or my services or my idea. And then I'm scared to death if I do sell my services or my idea. Yeah, because all of a sudden it's like me. I was like, oh my goodness, because here was my boss who I revered and respected greatly because he had really, he, he picked me for that job. I, I, I made the leap from agency life to corporate life because he believed in me and thought I could do a very difficult job. I had a wonderful tenure under him. I didn't want to disappoint him, but I really wanted him as my client and he bought it. And then the pressure was on Sean, because now I had to produce and I had to be thoughtful and strategic and be able to put plans and proposals together and be able to attend meetings and, and deliver value that was not what was already being offered by somebody else. Otherwise, why are you there? And so it does sort of force you to have the conversation is to say, what is my unique contribution to the world? And why would somebody pay me for it? And that kind of leads you down that path of thinking through, do I actually have a potential for a business here? Because they're generally speaking, lots of people that do what you do or have the same general idea you do. It's not too many original ideas under the sun, but there is something about what your take on it is what your perspective is, what's your voice, what are you bringing that somebody else isn't? And that I completely underestimated in myself because I thought, well, there's a lot of PR agencies out there. Anybody could hire. Why would they hire me? Why would they hire our team? And there were a whole lot of reasons why, but I didn't readily see it. So I do think to your point, we are hesitant because we can't see what other people see in us. And that's, that's not useful. That whole, makes us holds us back, that inner critic gets really loud. We don't take the chances we should. Um, you know, we're, we're too cautious or we're afraid of being rejected. That happens all the time in entrepreneurship. You have to get good at, okay, the answer was no. What do I learn from that? How could I get a yes next time? What could have been better that I can improve upon? So I have fewer no's and more yeses as I go forward. So it's a constant learning process. I mean, you, you said something that was interesting. You said you, you, we can't see what others see in us. Um, I mean, how do we do that? Uh, like, 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 how do we, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm all about the, the how, right? So people can have like action steps. But, you know, is that just surrounding ourselves with a certain type of people? Like, like how, do, how do we see what others see and it's, a, you know, helps us to get encouraged? No, it's a great question. And I think that we as um, leaders have to get good at this, not just as entrepreneurs, but as leaders. It's asking that sort of one magical question, which is what should I stop doing or start doing that would make me better to work with? So when you have a client or a customer, you want to ask them what's working, what's not, what needs to change, that sort of thing. You're asking for feedback. That's all you're doing. You're asking for feedback. So let's say I, I pitch you on an idea and I get a no from you. It's always a good thing to say is, hey, could you tell me why? What could I have done differently that would have won your business? What am I going to be able to do next time to win your business? And you might say, well, at least your price was just too high. Or you were offering, you didn't hear what I was saying. I said I wanted this, but you were t- trying to sell me that. And then I'm thinking, oh, I didn't do a good job of really listening to what the client said they wanted. Or I overpriced or I underpriced or whatever it may be. And so you, you have to take that. You have to be willing to ask the question, be willing to take the answer <laughs> and say, okay, Hey, thank you. That was really helpful. Don't, don't make a comment about it. Like, well, no, you're completely wrong. I didn't into, don't argue. Just say, thank you so much for that feedback. I really appreciate that. I know that's going to be helpful to me in the future and just walk away and say, okay, I need to go back to the drawing board because this isn't working. So getting good at asking for feedback from clients, prospects, from, from those that we love in our own home. Hey, what am I doing that's working? What am I doing this not (laughs) is a good question because you are raising self-awareness about how you are showing up 
and how others are perceiving you. And that is magical because it allows you to begin to identify a gap and close a gap. And that's really what we want, even though it might be hard to hear it. I don't want there to be a gap between us. If I want us to have relationship, I want to know how I can show up better for you. That's, that's good. I mean, it's around the constructive criticism, but I, I mean, everybody, right? I'm including myself. There's the, you know, the truth can hurt. So, you know, it's like, especially when they give it to you, you're like, man, like <laughs> now I have to change that. Right. But I, I think that one of the, you know, the, the great thing that you're saying is that it gets you closer to where you're trying to go. Right. So yes. it helps with your trajectory and it helps right. you. I mean, if it's a, if it's a gap, you got to close a gap somehow. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's better to close it than not to close it. But mm -hmm. from, from what you were just saying, right. You're really, you know, talking about your, your leadership and, you know, now you're doing um, executive coaching. And um, one of the things, which is a pretty interesting tie in, I know we talked about you uh, being on a motorcycle trip, but in your, your recent book, or you've been able to connect like, the motorcycle journey um, with leadership, like how, mm -hmm. like what's the connection? <laughs> how do those two things relate? <laughs> I know. Well, I always like, I do a lot of keynote speaking with my book. So thank you for asking. I wrote a book a couple of years ago on leadership. And basically what I, I did in the book, to be honest, is I told the leader's journey, the story from my very, very first time when I took on a leadership role and was so nervous because I had imposter syndrome, like, oh my goodness, they're going to, they're going to figure out, you know, that I'm not what they thought when they hired me. It was, it was my boss that I was thinking about. And after about two weeks there, I was like, man, I'm going to run circles around these people. They really need my help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but that night before I was so nervous, but so I tell the story all the way from when I had my very first leadership role, all the way through building my agency than actually selling my agency and what it was like to then be a part of a global organization and have a, a complete paradigm shift about the world and how I was supposed to function in that and what I was supposed to do. But it was really mostly a story about growth and the fact that I needed to become a, a leader who enjoyed the journey a lot more. So Sean, I was a workaholic and I think a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of leaders um, can be what I call sort of destination leaders. So they're very driven for results. They see the goal, they want to go there. And whenever they get there, wherever there is, you know, to achieve a certain goal, then they just turn right around and they want to do the next, the next, the next. They never stop and it's never enough. And you almost like wrap your whole identity around this concept of being successful and to be an entrepreneur or to be a founder or whatever we are getting our, our identity from. And it skews our thinking to where that's all we think about. And we tend to become very hard charging. So entrepreneurs especially have this problem and I did for sure. And uh, I, I got on the back of my husband's motorcycle for a 10 day trip, which in a moment of insanity, I agreed to. And I never looked back. I actually became hooked on motorcycling. And I, so I, I jokingly tell people that motorcycling saved my life because all I did was think about work and being a workaholic and trying to build up my company, but everything else in my life was kind of falling apart. And so I knew that wasn't the way to live and lead sustainably. At some point you're gonna crash and burn or you're gonna lose your family or your friends or whatever it may be. You're gonna become so overly focused on this one thing, your, your business or your company, that everything else suffers and that needed to change. So when I learned, I, when I came back from the trip, I learned to ride my own motorcycle. And it became the greatest gift for me because it reminded me of when I had been a little girl riding across the country in the back of a green station wagon and how much I used to enjoy travel and seeing the world and learning about people and places and learning about myself in the process. And I thought, gosh, I never do that anymore. Like that needs to change. Yeah. How do I become more of a journey minded leader? So that's, that's how motorcycling began to change my mind about so you, a lot of things. So when you said things were falling apart, is it just like, disconnected with friends or like 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 what exactly was falling apart yeah oh i would say i don't have time to invest in friendships relationships hobbies who has hobbies are you kidding i don't have hobbies because in my mind i'm like i'm just too important to have hobbies i've got a company over here that i'm building and it needs my full attention and so in all honesty, I look back now too, and I see that even as my children were becoming teenagers and were having different challenges in life, yeah. I would sort of run to my business rather than to help them or to deal with things at home that were challenging and different. So I was running away to what I thought was where I felt comfortable, which is running my business. 
And so you have to kind of ask yourself, what are you running from that you're pouring yourself into um, a business or your, your job or whatever it may be, professional interests? And why are you running from that? How can you stop and sort of turn around and think about how do I live a whole life and how do I invest in myself and invest in my relationships and, and be willing to ask questions like, you know, how do I need to show up differently for you to be able to enjoy all of life, you know, and to have relationships. We're not meant to live by ourselves. We're not meant to live in isolation, which is what we're all doing right now. We're meant to be in community with each other. And if you are cutting those relationships off in your life because they're too hard or people don't understand you, that to me would be a bit of a, of a warning sign to say, hmm, you know, when's the last time you really checked in with those who love you and say, how am I doing? What needs to change? That's actually very relatable, right? Especially with the, the pandemic we're going through right now and there's a lot of uh, isolation. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, interesting that dichotomy because it's caused a lot of people to kind of stop and reassess. But I think my, from you and your experience, you know, you're dealing with some, some executives and help people to scale. Yours avenue of stopping was the motor, motorcycle trip. Mm -hmm. But how do we as leaders and, and, and people that are, you know, gung ho, like I need to do this, I need to do this, really stop, assess, plan, like getting out of the weeds. Like, mm -hmm. what do you tell the people that you're working with? Yeah, um, it, that's a great question. And this is kind of this idea of what I call being a journey minded leader, which is realizing a lot of things like you're not in control of everything. You shouldn't try to control everything. Um, life is a journey and you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Be okay with living in the tension of uncertainty because you can't know everything that's going to happen, nor can you control it. Um, try to enjoy your life. Don't miss the moment. You know, that was one yeah. of the big things I did is I was missing everything because I was like, I don't have time for that. Oh, I can't do that. I need to, I've got to be focusing on the more important things. And if you miss sunsets and you miss seeing a smile on your child's face and you miss, you know, visiting with your grandmother and you miss reading a good book and you miss taking care of your physical health, taste, having moments of gratitude, investing in your spiritual well-being. All of these things are what make us whole people and allow us to live a whole and sustainable life so that when a crisis like what's happening right now happens, you don't lose it. You are resilient and you have sort of learned the art of being able to step back and get some broader perspective about things see life on sort of bigger terms as opposed to, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart today. Well, yes, there might be some things you need to attend to today, but take a step back. You know, one question I ask, this is a really useful how-to application. I help my clients when they seem very stuck in the weeds about what's happening right now. I'll say, fast forward a year from now, and I want you to think back and answer the question, how do I want to say that I showed up at this moment in time? How do you want to say you showed up? And I tell them, just pick three words. Three words is all. Just write it down. Three things that you want to be able to say. In 2020, I showed up like this. And these are aspirational goals, right? What, what might you say? You might say, well, I want to be um, thoughtful. I want to be measured. I want to be smart. I want to be kind. I want to be balanced. I mean, like it could be any word, right? And if you have three of them, then write them on a sticky note and put it right there by your computer monitor. And every day get up and say, oh yeah, that's right. I said, I want to be able to look back at this time and say, I showed up like this. So today I need to do whatever I can to try to really be this. And if you do it just one day at a time, you won't be perfect, but you might then to begin to string together days, weeks, months, and this time next year, you and I will have this conversation. You're like, yeah, at least remember you told me about that. I really did show up that way. Not every day, but a lot of days, I was really proud of who I was. And that is a powerful way to think more broadly instead of getting sucked into the very moment we're in. And then, and then but I guess my follow up question is like, what's the balance though? Cause you know, we're, you know, very determined to get things done. But then to your point, as you reflect and it's like, how do you want to, be, you know, how do you want to remember this certain occurrence, right? But then there's the occurrence of like, you know, I, I kick, I kick butt and now we're, 
you know, a billion dollar company, right? I mean, like, like how do we, because, you know, th there's a balance, right? There's the family, there's, as you said, spirituality, there's um, career. So like to balance that and how do, how do we have that good balance where we're, we still have a lot of work to do, but then there's also <laughs> so many other aspects of a life that we need to balance out. Yeah. Well, so here's one of the things I learned in my leadership uh, experience. There are times in your life when you have to lean into one thing because it needs you at that moment. And it could be your business, right? So right now may be the moment you do have to focus on your business. So you're trying to keep the doors open, or maybe you realize you need to pivot and you're gonna have to figure out what's our strategic plan. How are we gonna go to market? How do we price ourselves? Like starting all over again in different ways, right? That takes a lot from you and you need to concentrate and focus on that. Other things in your life can be willing to wait mm -hmm. as long as you do come back. <laughs> so the problem is when you never shift your focus away from your work, when it always only gets the very best of you, then there's nothing left for anybody else. And it makes it sort of not very rewarding to have a relationship with you if you're that way. So whatever that might be, friends, family, um, son, daughter, parent, any of those sorts of things, you, you do want those people in your life because one of the things I realize is that relationships are the greatest gifts that we have in this life. They are the things that last. Businesses come and go. Success is here for all of 15 minutes and then guess what? It's gone. And is that how you're going to define your happiness? Because if it is, you're going to be very disappointed because it doesn't last. So what is it that really lasts is the question to ask. And you know, professional interests like entrepreneurship. I, I very quickly tell people, gosh, that was the right of my life. It was the greatest experience I could have ever had. It happened to be in the field of public relations, but it could have been anything. And right now I'm doing something very different. I'm doing coaching and leadership development and training and consulting. And I love that too. So there's different legs of your journey. But I also wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be a wife and God love my husband. He's still with me 33 years later. I think he gets the award for the most patient <laughs> guy <laughs> there could ever be to have a wife who was an entrepreneur and also very driven because he was the one that sat me down and said, you know, something needs to change Elise. You know, we, we love you, but not people don't really like you that much right now. <laughs> and I said, I, I know I need to change. I don't know how. That was kind of my big aha. I was willing to become different, but I didn't know what to do to be a different person. And that sort of began a new journey, which is, okay, like, what does it mean to show up with a more balanced life? Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I really, you know, take to heart what you said about lean in. There's times in our lives where we have to lean into that one thing. Like I got to put everything to the side and focus on this. Um, that's something for me, like what you said, especially during these times, there's some evaluation that I'm going to be doing later on this week because, you know, as, you know, as we prioritize, it's like, what are you going to give your all in so that you can make sure you're able to succeed? Um, so I guess with, with that, right. So we, we lean in and to balance the other things that are important is is a good method just to you know we, we pick a date and say hey I, i'll i'll look at this and re and, and evaluate it later on to see exactly you know can i pick it back up um because i know people yeah. that are talking to you is just like hey i still want to do this i'll lean in now but then <laughs> when, when can i do this yeah no that uh, i agree it, it's it's it is, it is a life is a linear experience, right? We can't do everything all at once. And I do tell people this one aha I had about leadership. I get asked this question most often by women, um, which is, can you have it all? And I say, absolutely, you can have it all, but not all at the same time. And there are times that you lean in, as you say. So I remember when I was starting my company, um, it was also a decision I made to be my own boss because I had our daughter who was only a year and a half at the time. My husband was, um, had just finished uh, many, many years of medical training and he was beginning his practice as an orthopedic surgeon. He was, he was at the hospital, three different hospitals all, all the time, every day, seven days a week, always gone, really hard. Um, it wasn't always like that, but in the early years, it really was, as most things are, you know, really demanding when you first start. 
And I thought, who's going to be my, who's going to be the mom to my daughter? And, and then I ended up, we had a son too. And I, I had different job offers that I remember in those early years. And I kept saying, yeah, but I want to be there for my kids because I just feel like who's going to be their mom, you know, if I'm not, and it isn't that you can't be, obviously there are many, many working moms and dads that have to be too. They don't have a choice. They have to be able to work to support their families. And so we all, we get by with what we need to, but we can make these choices that say, but I want to be able to spend time with my kids in different ways. And that's part of you knowing and understanding your children is what is meaningful to them. Is it reading them a bedtime story at night? For me, it was, I wanted to drop, be the last person that my kids saw before they walked in the door of the school building. So in their young elementary school days, I was the one that took them to school. And as they were getting out of the car, I'd say, love you, praying for you, have a great day, make it a great day. You know, come try to just be positive as they were <gasps> sometimes with dread walking to the school yeah, building, yeah. depending on what was going on in their life. Because I was like, you can do it. And I wanted them to have that sense of, oh yeah, my mom believes in me. Like I, I know I can try. And I don't know that they got that message, but I was hopeful that that was something positive in their life. So I would sort of carve out those early morning school runs as just a way to create some consistency in their life, even though I worked a lot during the days. Yeah, no, I, wonderful, wonderful story. So, I mean, that, that kind of transitions into just, just leadership in, in general, right? And, you know, we're all on our, our different paths when it comes to leadership. And, and one thing in philosophy that you said that I really believe in is that as leaders, it, it's not really about us. It's about, it's about others, right? And how are we going to, to better them? How are we going to support them, open up doors? For, for people that have, you know, they've, they've leaned in, they, they've assessed their life. What are, what are some core important qualities on developing one's leadership skills? Mm. Well, there are some that I think are really good. So um, I generally think of, I, I teach a lot of workshops on leadership and I have a sort of a way of thinking of it in three buckets. So there's leading work, which is kind of the foundational elements. Like you've got to be able to drive for results. You've got to be able to deliver on a promise, you know, make sure all of your assignments or all of the projects or all of your clients or your boss is satisfied because you've been able to hit the mark and hopefully then exceed it. So leading work, leading others, which is the team, right? Because if you're a leader, by definition, somebody is following you. Um, hopefully it's because they want to follow you, not because they have to follow you. And I often say too, leadership is not defined by title. It's your character. It's your ideas. It's your integrity, right? Is how you show up as a person. Can people trust you? Are you reliable? Are you credible? Um, are you somebody who cares about other people and not just yourself? And then there's that third bucket, which is leading self. And I will tell you honestly, Sean, people, um, generally most leaders are good at two of the three. And the two that they most focus on is leading work and leading others. They don't focus on leading themselves because that is the hardest part of all. Because I would much rather tell you what to do <laughs> or even try to make you happy if I were you were my client. But I don't want to begin to focus on my inner critic and my lack of emotional management and how I lose my temper or how I whatever, fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're working on in yourself, the imposter syndrome that you have, all of these things. We want to hide those things from the rest of the world. I don't want you to know those things about me. I want you to think I'm perfect and smart. And so we kind of curate this, carefully curate this persona of ourselves to the rest of the world. And it makes leaders seem unapproachable and inaccessible and not real. And then it only exacerbates the problem where I sit and go, well, gosh, I look at Sean, he's just got his act so together, like, I'm not that good, you know, and it just makes us feel worse about ourselves. And I think social media contributes to this so badly, so much. And we compare ourselves with the rest of the world. The problem is we're comparing ourselves to false personas, because in reality, we're all broken, we're all struggling, we all have lots that we need to change and improve upon. But leading yourself is the one area that would most advance your career as a leader and as an entrepreneur if you were willing to invest in it. And that's because that's the area that most people are not willing to, to do the hard work. 
Yeah, I'm smiling because, I mean, with social media, with all the things that we know, for whatever reason, we, we still forget that everybody's going through their own challenges. There's, there's no one that has a perfect life. Doesn't matter, you know, how famous you are, how much money you have. There's, there's, everyone's got their, their challenge and their struggles that they, that they have to deal with. And for whatever reason, sometimes we even put those blockers on and then social media has this facade that everything's all great. Right. And we know it's not, but then, you know, we, we kind of skip that through our minds. Now, you know, as you transition and you work with, you know, CEOs and founders, you know, one of the things is like, they, they have to stay motivated. Right. And, you know, it could be a company that's successful, but it's like, okay, but, but now what, right. How do you, how do you get them to the next level and then the next mm-hmm. level and then the next level? Yeah, I love doing that. That's one of the things that gives me the greatest joy is to take a leader who wants to get better and they want to grow and they know they have potential to do more in their life, whatever that might mean for them. But maybe they don't quite know how to get there. Or maybe they know they've got this thing that's kind of holding them back and they would love to be able to break free from that fear or that inner critic or just Um, all of the things that just make us feel like we're not worthy or we're not capable. And so I spend a lot of time helping to sort of shift mindset, getting people to see and think about the world and themselves in very different ways. There's a lot of cognitive strategies that I teach of how you do that that are very effective. I got my executive coaching training through the Neuro Leadership Institute. I think you and I have talked about that before, but I learned a lot about neuroscience and the power of what's going on in the brain and the fact that we now actually, thanks to technology and things like functional MRI, you can actually see the brain light up in different ways. So we know what parts of the brain work in different ways. And that just basic knowledge and understanding of your brain and how it works helps you understand, oh my goodness, I have so much more control than I think I do over how I react, how I feel, how I decide to show up. Um, I learn things like inhibition, which is all the things I'm not supposed to say and do. (laughs) And it kind of stops you from uh, saying something that's going to break a relationship or ruin something, or you're going to have to spend a lot of time backpedaling and apologizing. And if we could just stop ourselves from these triggers and showing up in ways that are not so good for us and not so good for other people. Like, how do you do that? So I spend a lot of time helping clients learn how to think very differently, how to manage themselves very differently, and how to understand that fundamentally, I can't change you or anybody else in the world, but I can change me. And that's really the most powerful thing to do is to change yourself Because when you show up differently, it actually forces the rest of the world to respond very differently to you because you're not the same person anymore. So when I changed and learned how to ride a motorcycle and stopped being so destination focused, I started showing up in a very different way for my team. And people were like, oh my gosh, you're really different. I'd say, really? Well, how does that make you feel? And they were like, well, I don't really know. I mean, I like it, (laughs) but (laughs) it's spooky. Is it going to last? And what does that mean for me? And that was when I began to realize, oh my goodness, as you said earlier, it's not about me. It's about everybody else. And it's like, I have the ability to help so many people invest in them, coach them, give them opportunity, give them a promotion or give them a chance to build their career. Like I need to let go because I was holding on to all the things that I loved and that I was comfortable doing. And I had to realize that I needed to be a leader who releases, you know, a leader who lets go of all the good stuff and shares it with other people. And then that then turns around and I have to say, well, now I have to grow and I have to learn new skills and a new role or a new career or whatever it might be for me. How do I take myself to the next level? And that's a huge, that's a big mindset shift for leaders because our instinct is to hold on to what we know and what we like and what we think we've worked so hard to get. And I don't want you taking it from me, but the best leaders go, oh my goodness, like this is a huge opportunity for me to give it away and to change the lives for good, everybody around me. And in so doing, I know I'm going to benefit 10 times more when I show up that way for other people. I'm going to become a very different person and I'm going to like me a lot better when I do. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's very, it's very psychological, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm glad you connected that to the neurology of our brains and there's different things that, 
that trigger us. And there's different things that we have to quote unquote trick our minds to be able to push forward because as as we matriculate through life, there's there's things that we get comfortable with, there's challenges that we, you know, we know that are good for us that we don't always go through. So I think that um, what you said, whether you're working with, you know, a director, a CEO, an employee, it's like we all have to psychologically think about what is it that's going to trigger us to do the the positive behavior. Mm. Now, I guess when it comes to, you know, right now we're, you know, COVID-19, global pandemic, there's a lot of change that's happening around for people. Um, and, and, and we talk about mental health and just how people are just you know, wanting to change and to be different. So putting you in a situation where there's someone out there, they're listening to this, they, they want to change their, their situation, whatever it may be, and they, they feel like they're in a rut. So what's, what's like the most important thing that you can tell them, hey, this is how you can get out of it? Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, that's a really a good question. What's the most important thing? I, could tell I think it would be to really get to know um, what's important to you. Like get back to the real core and the essence of who you are and what is it about where you are right now that isn't working. And a lot of times this is something as simple as saying, I don't know, what are my values? Like there's a great exercise I do with my clients where I give them a sheet of words, like you could go on the internet and find this, like values, you know, words like family or respect or integrity or impact or influence or whatever those words, it's like a whole sheet of words. And I say, just circle any of those words that seem like they really resonate with you. And then I have them narrow it down to 10. And then I tell them they can only pick five. And those five, if you look at those five words, is that really capture the essence of who you are? What motivates you? What drives you? What you believe in? What really gives you the most joy and fulfillment in life? Those five words. And if if you can boil it down to that, then the next question is, well, how does that align with what you're doing right now? (laughs) And a lot of times that's where people go, uh, like it really doesn't. There's a big gap or, and it's particularly interesting when you say, my values don't really align with my employer's values. And it don't have to be a perfect overlap, right? We can accommodate a lot of different differences in ourselves and others and certainly in our employers. But if there's a really significant gap in your values, that should say something. And then you can begin to ask yourself, well, what would I be doing differently that would more align with who I really am? And that's back to the question I asked my mom sitting at the edge of her bed is what do you want me to be? She said, I want you to be happy. And that's when you think about, oh, I get real joy and fulfillment from these types of things. Then you can think, well, is is that something I could do in a career? Or is it something that at least if I'm going to be making money this way, I can create hobbies and space in my life and find community with people who also love those same things. And whether it's you know, rescuing pets or, you know, feeding the hungry or getting involved in environmental causes. My goodness, the list is a mile long, right? Of all the things we could do that mean something to us. And that is really often where your best relationships will come is when you have found the intersection of something you're passionate about and you met other people that felt the same way. There's like a huge amount of joy and reward that comes from those types of relationships because you believe in the same things and that's that's a wonderful thing look at that full circle around happiness right mm-hmm. i mean the, <laughs> the key though right and it's, it's 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 great because be happy whatever it may be just be happy because that mm-hmm. can get you through any time and then at the end of the day you're just content with the things that you have and that's true truly what success means so we're gonna take you through a lightning round so first thing that comes, and it's going to be two options. Choose what comes to your head, and then I'm going to let you have some final words. Um, coffee or tea? Coffee. Oh, definitely oh, cold oh, brew. Whoa. <laughs> cold cold <laughs> like, brew I, coffee. I see, I see you had yours today. That was quick. I love it, yeah. <laughs> uh, live in a big city or small city? Big city. All right. Uh, public relations or, or executive coaching? Oh, gosh, oh, that's too hard to ask. <laughs> well, I guess I'd say at this stage of my life, it's executive coaching. It's helping other leaders be great. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, favorite day of the week? Oh, gosh. Well, Sunday, because it's the Lord's Day. Oh, right? love, it. Yeah. love it. Love it. Love yeah. it. And it's also a wonderful time to slow down and spend time with family. And relax. I like that. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, this has been great. I'm going to leave you with final words of encouragement 
talk to, you know, any audience that you feel like you need to get your message through, but, you know, leave us with some final words of encouragement. Well, I'll tell you one of the most important things I learned from motorcycling was um, the journey matters as much as the destination. And too often we focus just on getting to the goal, the result, right? Happy, crossing the finish line. But that's not the way that life is meant to be lived. Life is meant to be savored and experienced, not accomplished. We need to enjoy the ride while we have it because we may not always have this ride. So, so put the kickstand down, get off your bike, look around and really just appreciate how beautiful where you are right now really is because this moment will be gone and you don't want to look back and regret. That wrap around packaged up bow on top. At least thank you very much. I, I like the, the fact you gave us a lot of how to's and actionable things that we can do. So thank you very much for, for being on our show and wishing you great success. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a really great pleasure to talk with you today. Please remember to like and subscribe. Oh, 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 oh,